Yes, we are live now. We are. We are. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is NMC Around the Globe, and I'm your host today. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and it was excellent uh, to be part of organizing session and also um, organizing this panel today. We have uh, five excellent panelists that uh, kindly accepted to um, join us today. So we have uh, Drs. Amita Kapoor, um, Ramzi Halabi, uh, Ilkay Ulusoy, uh, we have Dr. Uh, Takufumi Ayanagisawa, and Dr. Iota uh, Poirazi that um, are going to discuss some of the challenges and um, solutions that they have found in doing research and teaching and mentoring in their own countries. And uh, they're going to tell us what inspires them and um, how they go about their day-to-day uh, -day research adventures. Uh, so uh, we have an hour and we have uh, a few questions to get through. So we are going to um, first ask the speakers to introduce themselves briefly and uh, I will pose the questions and we will have each of them uh, discuss these with us. Um, please uh, post your questions in the chat and uh, we hope that uh, we can answer some of them as well. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to um, uh, please uh, have uh, our speakers introduce themselves um, in no particular order. Uh, Dr. Kapoor first. Uh, thank you. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of NMC and all the participants for being here. Uh, I'm Dr. Amita Kapoor, and uh, I have been teaching in University of Delhi for the last 25 years. I joined very young and I did my PhD later on, and therefore I have the idea of both what happens when you have some research experience and what happens when you do not have research experience, how the teaching and the how research life differs. And beside that, I have been writing books, and for the last few years I have been trying to, sh uh, means I have been shifting from academia towards industry. So it's kind of almost complete now. So that's all about me. Thanks. Um, next, we have Dr. Uh, Ramzi Halabi. Hello, everyone. I'm Ramzi Halabi. I'm from Lebanon. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I have my I have a PhD from Université de Lyon in uh, signal processing and machine learning. I currently teach uh, signal processing, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and computational neuroscience at the Rafiq Hari University in Lebanon. Uh, and I'm the co-founder and CTO of a uh, company that is actually designing an innovative design for a wearable glucometer based on RF interactions with blood molecules. So I basically have like 10 years of combined experience between academia and industry as well. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Iota Poirasi. Hi, uh, my name is Yota Poirazi. Um, I can't really thank the organizers for the invitation because I was involved in this, uh, but I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, I am a researcher, so my teaching experience is relatively limited compared to the others. I, I run a lab at the, uh, uh, the Foundation for Research and Technology on Crete in Talas. And the specialty of the lab is uh, to study dendrites using mostly computational methods but also recently some experiments. And I did my undergraduate uh, studies in Cyprus, so where I am originally from. So I'm you know, near the uh, other regions like uh, Lebanon, for example. And uh, now I work in Crete. Uh, so I also have the Greek experience running a lab there. Um, thank you. Next, we have uh, Dr. Yana Gisawa. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. I'm Takafumi Yana Gisawa. Uh, I'm from Japan. Uh, uh, I'm a, a neurosurgeon uh, working in, in Osaka. Uh, uh, I'm, I have been working on development of brain-computer interface uh, using uh, intracranial EEG. Uh, so I, I'm, uh, uh, I'm developing the, the, the machine learning technique to 
decode the uh, invasive signals and uh, apply the, uh, the development of brain computer interface. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and also, I, I'm uh, having the one laboratory to for the research purpose. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm exciting to join this uh, synchrony. Thank you. Um, and uh, we have Dr. Ulusoy. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this session. Actually, uh, I have graduated from Middle East Technical University Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. And then I did my master's studies in Ohio State and PhD partially in Turkey and partially in University of York. Uh, and I did biomedical engineering in most of these times. Uh, I started, actually my uh, basic field is robotics, uh, machine learning, and signal processing. But I try to apply all, all, all these uh, knowledge for uh, biomedical applications and use mostly uh, the brain. I did lots of image processing uh, tasks. I had, start, I had a startup in this field, but then uh, I'm doing neuroscience research uh, at the moment from an engineering perspective. Uh, I'm trying to fit some mathematical models which are probabilistic and nonlinear to some brain functions at various information scales. So I use neuroimages in my research. Uh, for example, I did modeling of the distribution of fibers in corpus callosum, and I did modeling of effective connectivity, which means causal relations among large brain regions. And also nowadays, I am working on modeling cell assemblies, neuron pools to store information. Uh, I, from my uh, original uh, education, I also work on artificial intelligence and try to find disease signatures using deep networks. And also I try to model human learning by artificial neural networks and trying to develop algorithms for not only learning, but also uh, for cognition. At the moment, uh, I'm the chair of the Department of Electrical Engineering at METU, and we are uh, having all fields of electrical engineering. So neuroscience is also included in our department, as well as hardware, you know, related to neuromorphic, you know, hardware, and all these things are handled at different departments uh, in my institute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice introductions. So um, let's go to our first question which is, uh, what is the most rewarding aspect of doing science for you uh, in your home country? And uh, we go to Amita, please, first. Well, I would say research by itself is its own reward. Means when you are doing some sort of research and you get any result, any relevant result, when you're not getting any answers, that by itself is a big reward. Means I am not thinking about what I will get as a, uh, you know, something as a appreciation or something as a recognition or publishing. That comes much later. But when you are doing research, doing research is its own reward. That is what I would say, and that is what I find most satisfying. So when I'm working on a problem and I'm able to find something, you know, interesting, means it goes on in the mind throughout the day and the night, and suddenly you find that oh, this is going to work and then you start doing on it and it works. That is the best reward, I would say, for me at least. Uh, thank you, and Ramsey. Yeah, concerning the reward, actually, uh, I'm going to get a bit uh, more specific in terms of the field that we are working, at, uh, working with, which is computational neuroscience. And inside Lebanon, uh, our countries actually are known as the consumer countries, the countries that do not really produce uh, technology to the uh, rest of the world. However, being able to be a part of this uh, kind of research, which is so collaborative, this by itself uh, is the reward, just like doctor said. So the reward of being a researcher is the reward actually by itself. So this is firstly working in computational neuroscience and dealing with uh, patient health and the biomedical field by itself is also rewarding 
because you are uh, able to provide the community with tools that are really complex to simplify the understanding of diseases, which simplifies the issue of, let's say, mental health, cognition, memory, and so on. So using uh, your skills, using this knowledge that you have acquired uh, throughout a lot of years in order to improve people's health and human health and human life in general, I think this is the most rewarding. And uh, definitely the most rewarding part is to see your work uh, manifested in machines, manifested in algorithms that are being applied in the industry, not just, uh, not just on the shelf PhDs or on the shelf research. Seeing your work actually being implemented in a certain design, in a certain machine, in a certain complex uh, development process. So it's the whole research and development process that is so rewarding. And we hope to always be a part of this uh, community that is helping others. And that's it for me. Thank you. 100 <laughs> percent. Um, Yota, please. Yeah, I would agree with both of the two previous statements. For me, the, the curiosity driven things that we do, this aha moment, this excitement of working continuously with something new is the most rewarding. Maybe, you know, one of the most rewarding factors. The other one that I appreciate a lot is working with young people, you know, having the opportunity to sit down with a team and, you know, exchange ideas and get feedback and see them grow and see them believe in themselves and coming up with better and better ideas every day. And, uh, you know, helping them to develop as scientists uh, throughout the years that we work together, I find that very satisfying as well. So, that's for me. Thank you. Uh, Taku for me? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I agree uh, with uh, other uh, members. And actually, uh, I'm because I'm working in to develop the clinical uh, application. Uh, my biggest uh, reward is to find uh, some something way uh, to develop the way to help patient. So uh, my, for me, it's very important to uh, finding some kind of diagnostic method or treatment method. So that, that's my uh, biggest reward. And Ilkay. <laughs> I think you're on mute. Okay, can you hear now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I agree with all of my friends. Actually, learning, learning is the the best reward. So each piece of new information you get helps a little more to understand the meaning of life. You know who we are, why we are here, how things should change for the humankind, and all those things uh, are important. Yes, and thank you for this diverse perspective. <laughs> um, our second question is that, what do you think of uh, your uh, community in your country, your neuroscience uh, research community? Do you think it's large enough? Uh, do you find collaborators easier or are most of your collaborators international? Um, Amita. Well, uh, I would say I'm basically working in the area which is more towards artificial intelligence, deep learning rather than neuroscience. But still with my interest in neuroscience, uh, finding people within India who are working in neuroscience is slightly difficult. Because there are people, I would not say they're not there, but it is slightly difficult. It's more towards most of them are working either more towards the biological side. Finding someone working in computational neuroscience becomes more difficult. And as a result, I definitely have more collaborators outside India as compared to India. Thank you, uh, Ramsey. Yeah, concerning Lebanon, actually, uh, I'm really glad I'm participating in this because we like this part of the part of the world, which is uh, actually, which has its own like aspect of research and aspect of academia. Uh, we focus more on teaching rather than research. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically in our country, uh, we have a few universities in comparison with India or China or Japan or uh, the United States, let's say. We have few research centers, which is not uh, uh, something that is very exciting to students because they don't find their niche in terms of research. This is one. 
uh, the other point is the field that we are working with, which we're working uh, in, which is computational neuroscience. Worldwide, it is not uh, a field that you find a lot of researchers that are really into. So uh, how about Lebanon, which is a very, very small country, who has a, uh, which has a small number of universities and small number of research labs. So the probability becomes like one over a million to find a uh, neuroscientist or computational neuroscientist. Add to that PhDs in neuroscience and computational neuroscience and research, you are getting close to one over 10 million, I think, and even more. So uh, b basically, if I want to describe it, I would say that uh, this field is re restricted to like a couple of research centers or research labs in private universities in Lebanon. And uh, the sad thing is we do not have a countrywide um, community that holds seminars and conferences in that specific, uh, specific field. So we have biomedical engineering conferences, biomedical engineering seminars, and we have like a section a section concerned with neuroinformatics or neuroscience. Uh, the, the other thing is I'm so glad to, uh, to have a, a neurosurgeon with us because in Lebanon over here, we do not really uh, collaborate. So we, we don't have a collaboration between biomedical engineers and neurosurgeons, uh, bioinformaticians and so on. So what happens is we have our own way of uh, dealing with research. So we look for external collaborators we look for external research grants, external research uh, opportunities. When uh, surgeons or physicians do their research, they're not really concerned with uh, machine learning, AI, computation, modeling, and so on. They only rely on the biological aspect. So it's like we have different pieces of the puzzle that are not connected. However, if we connect them, we would arrive or, and reach excellent states of research. But we do not have this uh, gathering mechanism between us. I don't want to talk too much. I may be uh, exceeding my time limit. So, yeah, I, uh, this is enough, I think. Thank you very much. That yeah. was excellent. Um, and Ilkay, please. Yeah. Actually, in Turkey, in my country, when we talk about neuroscience, it's usually an interdisciplinary work done by medical scientists. And the term interdisciplinary usually means anatomy, physiology, neurology, and so on. So which are all fields of medicine. But the real interdisciplinary work should include engineers as well. So me, myself, and my and researchers in my institution, in my university, uh, we have um, a huge undergrad program of everything except medicine and law. So we are collaborating with uh, researchers at medical schools, uh, which are very good in both research and medical practices. Because, uh, you know, in my field, we need data. We need data to, you know, understand things. And usually uh, people at medical schools uh, find it easier to reach the data. So uh, my institution uh, is basically engineering, doing engineering. That's why we are collaborating uh, other medical schools uh, in Turkey. And yes, everybody knows about neuroscience but uh, there is not a specific uh, PhD field or uh, undergraduate uh, field uh, named neuroscience. So it's evolving every day. So maybe in the near future, we will have neuroscience as undergraduate, I don't know. Thank you. Um, indeed, well-defined PhD programs are, are really important. Um, uh, Taku Fumi, please. Yes, uh, actually, Japan also do not have the neuroscience department. So usually, the, the people who want to learn the neuroscience uh, need to go to very different discipline or the de department. So uh, every every student uh, go to the uh, biomedic uh, engineering or the uh, medicine or kind of uh, psychology so based on their interest so it's kind of difficult to find a good place to get together or learn whole uh, whole aspect of the neuroscience and also uh, the uh, because I'm working in a brain computer interface it's kind of pretty much a multidisciplinary uh, field so we need to collaborate with 
bioengineering and the medicine or surgery. So uh, it's sometimes it's very difficult to find uh, good collaborators in this field. Actually, in Japan, I, I think less than 10 neurosurgeons are working in this field. So it's very, very difficult to uh, talk with this, this, this kind of uh, topics. And uh, yeah, and sometimes the, 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 because the many different disciplines and the, the researchers come from many, very different disciplines. So it's difficult to talk in same language. So they, they talk in different aspects. So that's the difficulty in Japan. Thank you for elaborating. And um, Iota, please. Yeah, the situation is very similar in Greece as well. I think uh, maybe less than five people have uh, been working on computational neuroscience throughout the country. We don't have a dedicated training program, not at the undergraduate or the graduate level for computational neuroscience either. And all of our my collaborators are uh, from abroad. And I wouldn't say that's the toughest thing because it hasn't been too difficult to find collaborators from abroad. What I find is maybe the biggest challenge is this uh, scientific loneliness that there is nobody around to run by an idea with, you know, to say, yeah, I have this idea. Is it a good one? Is it worth pursuing? Um, and that, especially in the beginning of my career, that was really devastating because it's very hard to make the right decisions, right? This is a good question to ask. Should I go ahead with this project or, you know, all these things uh, where you would need someone, a local mentor, it's very hard to find um, if there is no critical mass. Um, and yeah, there isn't any. Yes, um, very interesting. And it actually leads to our next question. Uh, which is, uh, what did you find the major barrier in doing science in your country? Um, it could be funding, teaching overload, quality of courses, lack of collaborators, uh, physical isolation, lack of networking, limited access to infrastructure. So if you could please elaborate on, on some of them, uh, that would be wonderful. And Anita, please. Okay. So I would say actually when you start when you start with your research career, all of these things play a role. Means like for example, if I start with my teaching career, in the starting I was having more than twenty lectures a week. So if I'm giving 20 lectures, I am not left up with any time for research. So obviously teaching load becomes a uh, thing especially when you are in the starting of the career same same goes for the funding funding depends upon how much publications you already have so if you are not getting time because of the teaching for doing research again it suffers again you know collaborators and everything means i guess it is combination of all these things which are barriers and i presume we all face through them as we have progressed in our research journey and definitely uh, you know uh, have kind of uh, taken help of the global world, I would say rather, to overcome those barriers. So uh, that is there. So personally, I would not say I have felt uh, I have faced anything particularly special. It's like, you know, going through the whole process altogether, which is, I guess, more or less same for all the researchers. Thank you very much. Uh, Ramsey, please. Yeah, actually, I tend to agree, uh, completely agree with this. Uh, it's like a combination, what, but like a, a weighted combination of these. So it differs from country to the other, I think, or from a region to the other in terms of weights. But we all are suffering from the same problems, uh, same barriers, actually. You mentioned everything. But if it were me uh, in, in Lebanon over here, it's mainly the lack of funding and teaching overload. Uh, lack of funding because we, we, we like have one funding institution at Lebanon, CNRS. And uh, this, uh, the amount of money it gives you per project depends on your, uh, let's say, on your um, connections, depends on um, who is the professor who is applying, do they know him, do they not know him, uh, it's, it's a matter of reputation. They, they actually like some universities more than others, so some universities have access to a lot of money, some other universities have, lack, have access to no money. So even if the research project is amazing and the researchers are very skilled, it's like this university will not get money and deal with it. So it's uh, it's the biggest barrier, actually. Um, when we get money, you know that our field, in order to uh, get equipment to do research, is very expensive. 
So to get a decent EEG, let's say HD EEG system, you need to you need to pay money if you want to get an fMRI, let's say, to a research center that is decent enough to be and high resolution and so on. You need to pay a lot of money. So no funding means no data, and no data means no research. So we go back to the same point, which is go and collaborate with the U.S., with Canada, and so on to get data. Uh, thankfully, we are uh, overcoming one of these. And I don't know if this is another question. I will not be elaborating a lot on it. Okay, so, but we are overcoming this by having the issue of open source access, open source data, which we will be discussing hopefully uh, during this session. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Ilkay, please. Yeah, actually, uh, I find it very hard to find uh, students to work with. Uh, since there is not a clearly defined neuroscience job, uh, they can only become faculty members, but positions are very limited. So very few uh, students are interested in this kind of uh, research. Uh, yes, my teaching load is very high. Uh, I, I am uh, chairing a department of 1,600 students. Uh, we are 50 faculty members and each of us are teaching courses each semester with many uh, students but it is a way of meeting new students you know it's a way of uh, knowing them it's a way of uh, expressing yourself to them so it's a good way to find <laughs> good students funding yes it is the most uh, problematic Crucial. issue especially funding which would be enough for hardware research it is nearly impossible, uh, so this is the yeah, hardest thing to uh, handle with. Thank you. Um, it was interesting that you pointed um, lack of um, future in terms of established jobs, permanent jobs, permanent positions, yes. and that being a motivation for for yes. um, lack of enthusiasm for mm -hmm. trainees to, to come and join the lab. Um, Talk phone, please. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, the, the fi finding the student on the, and also finding the postdoc is very, very difficult in Japan. So because they, uh, in Japan, uh, the PhD student are decreasing uh, continuously in all fields of the science. So that's the, uh, even, uh, even PI get uh, enough funding uh, it's pretty much difficult to make a, a good team to work with. And uh, that's because I think the, the biggest reason is the in Japan, it's very difficult to find make a realistic career path. So uh, of course the academic position is very, very difficult to get. Uh, that's, I think that's the common in, in any anywhere in the world. <laughs> but uh, I think even after I even quit the academic job, it's pretty much difficult to find uh, another career for the PhD student. Because in Japan, uh, PhD does not make advantage to obtain a new job. And also even having PhD uh, uh, prevent that or some kind of obstacles to obtain the job. So it's a very uh, tragic situation, but uh, th therefore the student uh, tend to uh, avoid having the PhD just to quit the, after master course. So that's the biggest problem in Japan, I guess. Thank you. Um, Yota, please. Yeah, um, I want to start with the positive thing, which is that we have a very high quality of students here in Greece. So no complaints on that front. The local students are very well trained and it's very, I haven't had any problems there. It has been quite difficult to attract foreigners to Greece, like even uh, postdocs or PhD students, they, they don't want to come for some reason. Uh, I don't know, uh, we're not very good in attracting them, not only me, but I think everyone in the, in the Institute. So I'm not sure if it's a computational neuroscience thing or more general being on a small island in Greece, you know, while, without a huge reputation of the best places in Europe and the US. So the most difficult thing for me has been funding. 
Um, similarly to Lebanon, we have, uh, you know, very limited national funding. And in fact, I keep saying this, but in my 20 years as a PI, I've never had a single grant for computational neuroscience from Greece, never, ever. Uh, and it's not because I didn't try. I think it's because there are not enough people here to understand why this is an important thing to do and to give us the money. So we rely exclusively on European and international funding to do our research. And that, as we all know, is super competitive. So it's so much time and effort that you have to spend, uh, you know, in writing grants uh, so that we just get the ones we need to do our science. Uh, and we're a well-funded lab. I'm not complaining on that. But the effort we have to put on getting this money, often I wonder whether it's worth the trouble. You know, it's just too much. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, starting with the positive. I should have actually encouraged that, <laughs> um, which, which uh, I can in the next question, uh, which is to everyone, how did you uh, overcome these barriers and what do you find uh, the positive the positive points in, in being in your country and, and doing research? Amita, please. Uh, I would say first and important part is persistence means if you really want to do research or any work persistence is important no matter which field you are in and regarding uh, overcoming barriers within my country I would say despite whatever negatives we think about that exist in our country there are certain positive things as well within the academic career. Like, for example, we have options of going for sabbatical leaves. We have options for going for study leaves. And these are the ways by which we can always, you know, increase our knowledge, our learning, and even I make use of that time for collaboration. So I did the same. I Since I did my uh, PhD while I was in service, I made use of study leave. I did my PhD for which I went to Germany, which definitely helped me in getting a broader perspective with respect to my area otherwise also and in terms of research as well. Right. And then uh, uh, last few years, I've taken sabbatical in which I was writing book where I was collaborating with people from Google and other places. So the thing is, uh, you know, all these collaborations take time. Writing something takes time. And if your job provides you with such facility to update yourself, that definitely helps you in overcoming the barriers. But yes, it requires persistence. It's not easy. Means I would say when I applied for the sabbatical, my application got rejected five times, but eventually it got passed. So I guess that matters, right? So persistence matters. That's the important thing. Indeed. And you are with uh, in your home country with your extended network. Yes. So, so that's a huge plus. Definitely, that's yes. A huge plus. Definitely, yes. 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 And balancing work and life is, is difficult. Uh, it's difficult in academia. Uh, Ramsey, uh, please. Okay, so concerning uh, the strategies that we use to uh, lift these barriers, uh, firstly, concerning funding, I think that uh, we do not lose hope in research and doing research because the cause is much uh, greater than the obstacles that we are going through. What we do is we search for external collaborators from other countries. So concerning funding, what we do is we collaborate with research labs and centers that already have the funding. And the good thing is, at least in my subdomain, which is AI, uh, connectivity analysis, and so on, what we do is we are used to open source data uh, analytics, and we are used to sitting with our laptops for like five, six days straight. So we're used to that. We're used to um, data analytics and working with data. So uh, getting data from the outside, getting data from other labs and performing computation on it is something that we are used to and that we uh, have passion towards, actually. So uh, while ha uh, um, although I am a biomedical engineer to begin with, and I'm used to dealing with equipment and designing equipment and using them and acquiring my own data, I got used to the fact of collaborating with people who already have clean data. And then we take this our analytics over here so this is how we uh, overcame the issue of funding we do not actually have to have the equipment uh, at our premises we can have access to data at least uh, concerning the overload hours which is a huge problem actually uh, especially in the university that i work at 
uh, if you ask for uh, some extra time to do some research or to maybe take out some load and, uh, and allocate some time for research, they say that you are a teaching institution and you are not a research institution. So you have to deal with this instead of uh, working on your research and getting students, getting grants, masters, PhDs, and so on. You have to teach day and night. So you start teaching at 7, 8, or let's say 8 a.m. and you finish at 5 p.m. You come back home very tired and then you have to start all over again and do your research. So this is one solution that is unhealthy actually, but it worked for a few years. Uh, it's very, very tiring actually. You have to teach during the day and then when it's time for you to see your family and rest, you have to do research till midnight because you didn't have time to do research because you have office hours, you have teaching, you have correction of exams, preparation, which, which takes a lot of time, especially teaching labs. Actually, it's like a two hour session over here, each lab. So teaching two labs and two courses during the same day, it's like an eight hour thing to do, which is or six hour in this case, which is uh, which is very hard, actually. Uh, and finally, concerning data, thankfully, we have uh, PhysioNet, Open Euro, and so on, uh, some in, in order to help our students get familiar with the data, let's say, because not all data that is published is up to the standards. But nowadays, as we all know, we are having standards. We are standardizing the issue of EEG data sharing, let's say, or fMRI images. If it's not up to the standards, it will not be published. It will generate errors or warnings on the online system. It will not be published. And this international community and the open access community is really helping a lot. And we are actually taking masters and PhD students uh, that, that are working outside. We are co-supervising projects. And we are even sending our students abroad. So now we teach the courses of computational neuroscience, AI, machine learning, and so on, signal processing. And then when they have enough skills, we send them for a training internship for a master's or a PhD outside, and we keep collaborating with them. So this is what we did to overcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we have Ilkay next, and we have questions um, as well uh, for the panelists in the question bar. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yes, we also try to collaborate with partners internationally and nationally and also open source software and hardware simulations are really very helpful uh, i am thankful to those people who organize these open software uh, things actually uh, in recent years uh, a nationally funded project has started uh, for it, it it's like you know a uh, connectome or brain or human brain uh, initiatives in you Europe and in uh, USA, so Turkey also started uh, such a nationwide uh, project, and uh, I was uh, one of the uh, you know uh, investigators who started this project, and uh, the, we by the way we have due to this uh, project uh, we gain uh, the privilege to access a computational resource which is again nationwide and which is a huge one so yeah uh, as my friend says uh, we have to you know try hard and hard and hard and after maybe years later you see that you get something so nowadays yes uh, i think we really get something uh, in uh, turkey in terms of neuroscience and resources um thank you for emphasizing open science um, open, open access articles, uh, open access conferences and databases, and um, that, that they improve your, your lives and your research in your home nations. Uh, talk for me, please. Uh, yes. Uh, so, the, because my problem is to find the uh, student or uh, researchers in my field, so uh, I, I'm doing two, uh, two, two things. Uh, one is to uh, make the uh the sorry make the uh, all many, many students can come can come to my uh disciplines so i invite the uh, uh student from the engineer or medicine to come in my lab uh to as work to work as the uh part-time job uh, and uh, 
uh, I, I'm making the team to do the uh, computational neuroscience research. So th this kind of uh, activity makes the, uh, the uh, decrease the barriers between the disciplines and uh, maybe uh, enhance the collaboration. And also uh, I'm trying to make some kind of uh, career path between the uh, academic and the industries. So I, I'm trying to collaborate with several companies to, to exchange the researchers between us. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, so I'm helping some several startup companies to uh, having the same similar goal. And uh, and actually some, some researchers join in my lab and, and also my student go into some companies. So these collaboration can uh, make the more uh, opportunity for the student to make the uh, different career paths. So, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for mentioning uh, intentional, inclusive mentoring uh, mm -hmm. across careers and across disciplines um, and encouraging people who are not um, exactly in your field to, to come to your lab and work with you. And also that some industries are open to collaboration and it can really help um, uh, personnel wise and, and financially. Um, and uh, Iota. So something that uh, made a big difference for me was when I, I joined um, communities like networks, like the Fence Cargill Network, for example, and uh, which is a European level group of, of, of people working in neuroscience from different countries. And that uh, made a big difference in my lab because it increased not only my ability to find collaborators, but also the visibility of the work we were doing. We got to have exchange visits between uh, other members of the network to be involved in a lot of, of events online so that people get to hear more about the work we do and they become more interested in it. And um, I think that was like the first thing that I did that changed somehow our positioning as, as a lab in the community uh, worldwide. And then after that, it was uh, the, the EMBO conference on dendrites that we organized uh, in Crete, which also put the island, uh, increased the island's visibility and, and attracted a lot of people of, or that work on our own field on the island. And that also helped a lot find new collaborators. And of course, Neuromatch and a Neuromatch Academy, uh, which are these wonderful, uh, I mean, I'm bragging now because we're helping, but still, I think, I think these are both wonderful initiatives to help people maximize their access uh, to uh, resources, to labs, to, to people out there sharing the same dreams and doing the same research, um, you know, supporting open science, all of the things that happen here, I think are fundamental for helping us, especially people working on uh, in, in countries that are kind of isolated, overcome all these barrier, the barriers. So yeah, that's for me. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I think I will go for a final question. And we have a number um, also posted um, in, in the ask question section. So um, how would you like to see the field changing um, in short term? Uh, next few years and long term, let's say next few decades, um, what do you want to see change most? Um, is it research assessment? Is it work-life balance? Um, is it uh, more national collaborations, international community? Um, what, what can make your research life and lab and mentorship more um, fruitful, exciting and, and fulfilling? And Amita, please. Well, I would say, to be honest, I find that uh, it's like short term, I would just say that instead of going for the hype in particular fields, we have more concentration into the actual things that are possible and that are not possible, especially when we talk about the deep learning and all that stuff, because many students, they come to you, it's like they come to me thinking that this is possible and this is happening, but it's just hype. And then again, uh, means like basically what I would say is that in the short term, I would like the right vision of my field to be presented to the students who are trying to pursue this particular area. They should be aware of what is possible and what is not possible and what really is needed rather than just going through and thinking that they have done a course on, let us say, three months course on Coursera and they are 
now expert in that field. That should not happen. So they should be aware of that particular perspective. That is my short term perspective. Long term, I would say, uh, you know, uh, I mean, personally, I feel everyone should be aware of programming. Everyone should be aware of the computational aspects and the AI aspects. What basically because AI is now part of our lives. Right. So if I'm using a tool, I should at least be aware of what its misuse can be and what its use can be. So these are the long term goals, which I think even if people are not going into the research into that area, at least the general public becomes aware of those concepts. And that, I guess, will always help in going for funding and improving research as well. Because when someone is aware of the real field, they will some of them will definitely go into the area and do the work. Thank you. Um, um, indeed, there are things that are hyped, publications that are hyped, uh, short-term um, transient look at success that is hyped, but uh, careers are long and, and they span a few decades. Uh, so um, looking, looking at the entire marathon um, is, is, is very important. Thank you. And uh, Ramzi, please. Yeah, well, I, I have to agree about the thing of uh, raising awareness. Uh, maybe uh, drawing a line between what you dream of achieving and what can be achieved practically and in real life. And this could not be done actually without organizing um, events like regular conferences, seminars, raising awareness, uh, creating some uh, maybe introductory sessions, uh, workshops to teach people, to teach students, undergrad and grad. I think we should start at the undergrad level actually. Because yeah. it's the undergrad undergrad uh, phase that shapes up your career later on. Uh, you are not expected to uh, uh, magically become a computational neuroscientist. Uh, you should be aware of the actual skills that you need. You need programming. You need uh, heavy mathematics in some cases, modeling, uh, numerical analysis. You need to be familiar with the tools that you need to use. Uh, you need to be aware of the packages that are uh, uh, open source right now available so that you start your training phase from your undergrad, maybe do like a graduation project that is related to computational neuroscience. And then if you are convinced and you know what is expected from you and what you should be expecting, you go towards your graduate studies and your PhD with ease. So we need to uh, organize countrywide and nationally and internationally uh, wide uh, events which uh, just like the one that you are doing uh, really thankfully and gratefully to so thank you uh, thank you so much for this uh, event and for such events because it helps students everywhere and even us the faculty members to uh, meet with people who are sharing the same interests i think this is the most uh, important point on the short term right now which is something regular actually that should be happening every every two months maybe quarterly maybe every year we should have a global event uh, like the ones that we are having. So this is uh, my take on it. Uh, concerning long term, I would love to see like a unified electronic health record system where all the research centers are sharing all of their data. However, it is it has some open source aspect and some restricted access. So because of confidentiality and not, and not dealing with data that they do not under, really understand or they are not really eligible to be working with. So we can have like a, a nationwide as step one, a nationwide EHR, let's say, for neuroscience, where all hospitals, research centers, universities are sharing their data. And then uh, renowned or let's say uh, accredited people will have access to it. Let's say faculty members, uh, neuroscientists, bioinformaticians, they will have like username, password, credentials to access data. And this will uh, aid in the collaboration. And on the international level, I would love to see actually like a unified thing. I don't know if it's like a dream, but to find all universities at the same time publishing their uh, data open source, uh, giving us insight about their research, their data sets, uh, and so on. Because uh, it's the internet. It's the whole goal behind internet, I think, having like the whole world uh, uh, at your disposal. So what you can do is you can access data from India, data from Japan, data from Greece. We can do everything just like we are communicating right now. I should be able to access your data if you trust that I am doing research in this field and I am capable of collaborating with you towards the benefit of humanity. So th this is what um, I think that should be done. And this is my view and perspective for this field. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for um, really emphasizing that uh, open exchange of data would really help researchers to work in their own home countries and uh, and do what they hope to do. Um, Ilkay, please. Uh, you're on mute, actually, I think. Am I? I'm not. Now we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, we are very close to um, replicate human brain learning and information processing, at least. And I think uh, we are getting close to understanding and modeling cognition and also, you know, how brain works, how diseases uh, happen and so on. Of course, it's, it's very hard and it takes years. It will take years. And also we are at an era of information, you know, huge number of information and data are produced everywhere. And it's hard to follow each one of them. Everyone is working on a part of, a pro of the problem, the main problem at some part of the world. So we need more information sharing and collaborations worldwide worldwide and we need to be effective better in you know reading and understanding and you know following what is actually happening all around the world and i don't know how actually um thank you for emphasizing that uh, scientists are generating more and more data <laughs> research and it's it's hard to catch up and uh, stay up to date even with those in your very specific um, subfield. Um, so it's important to keep the focus um, on that. Uh, Takofumi, please. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I, I agree the all aspect in the, uh, the uh, actually the, the data is important. And also uh, uh, in, in my uh, country, I, I would like to uh, have more uh, medical doctor uh, taking care of the computational aspect of the neuroscience or kind of medicine. So many doctors are ignoring or less aware of the computational part. So I'd like to help to bring such uh, medical doctors. So uh, that's in short time, I, I, I'd like to uh, educate or having the uh, kind of course to teach some machine learning or kind of uh, technique. Uh, for the medical student. So, and also I, I'd like to make such a collaborative situation environment to discuss with this, uh, such kind of computational aspect of the med medical problem. So yeah, that's the, my uh, role, yeah, thank you. Indeed, um, thank you for emphasizing that doctors and experimental researchers and clinicians need to get gain a better appreciation of computational work directly in their field or maybe uh, in the future, but um, work to provide data um, so that uh, our grants are funded and we can, you know, um, keep up with the energy and attract the students. Um, Iota, please. So I, I agree uh, with everything that has been said before, especially uh, I would uh, think that the idea of appreciating computational neuroscience among the greater neuroscience field, like in physics, for example, theoretical physics are highly respected, right? And models come before, let's say, the experiments. But in computational neuroscience, it's the other way around. Uh, at least that's the feeling I get often is that our field is not deemed as useful for many of our experimental, let's say, partners. Not all of them, but often you see that this, uh, you hear that this, what we're doing is just modeling and we can make a model do whatever we want, right? So somehow changing that and, and making people believe in the power of computational neuroscience in the future, I think, I don't know exactly how to do it, but, but I think is what we need in the future. And the other aspect that I, I don't know if anyone mentioned it, for me, it's, uh, it's a work-life balance. I mean, uh, we get uh, more and more overworked and overloaded as time goes by. And this is not healthy. And I think it's also not good for science, right? Because we can't really come up with the best ideas. So solve the most difficult problems if we are exhausted. So somehow in the future, we should come up with ways to change this. 
And the pandemic, especially for the computational neuroscience field, has not changed that. It may have even made it worse because we can continue our work you know, behind a desk at home and a computer at home. So we really need to strive on to find some balance there as well. Those are important things for the future, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, such excellent uh, and, and diverse responses. Um, just, um, we haven't had uh, really a chance to orally um, address the, the questions. Uh, one, I think we covered uh, quite a few, actually. You, you covered quite a few. Uh, one that uh, remains, I think, is about research culture, because how can we um, improve a culture of hiring, assessment, promotion, uh, and, and, um, and careers after? Uh, academia so that we attract more students and we um, we work more pleasantly. Um, has any of you um, been involved in improving research culture in your home country? Are you working with funding agencies? Are you working with your universities to change policies um, to, to improve uh, working conditions, funding conditions? If uh, one or two of you could uh, please um, chime in, that would be wonderful. Well, I would say out here that uh, just because you are working in a committee which is looking into it, you can make suggestions, but bureaucracy takes its own, own time, right? So, yes, definitely as an academician, we have been trying to speak about what should be the right approach for hiring, for promoting research and everything. But taking its shape, I guess, will take some time at least in my country. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Ramsey? Well, actually, I, I haven't been involved in such a policy changing process. So I might leave this stage for uh, another professor to answer. Actually, you know, I can say a couple of things. Actually, uh, this takes time, as uh, uh, Amita says. Uh, first, you need to form, uh, you know, it should be ready, you know, the community should be ready for such a, a change. And to make them ready, there should be enough number of people who are interested in this thing. And the way to increase uh, the number of people is, you know, to, you know, have projects, have some products or have some outputs. So. I think we need some time too, but yes, this is in our minds. I mean, yeah, this should happen soon. Actually, to, to, uh, in my country, to change the policy, uh, usually I do the, the, the make, making the problem clear. So, uh, for example, we, we can uh, do some seminar or conference to raise up the, the, the new new a new uh, problem in the science and uh, uh, promote that the, what, why it's important and uh, how it's uh, related to our country or something. And uh, yeah, the, these uh, activities have to change the, uh, the policy in, in Japan. And uh, yeah, sometimes it, it works. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we are at the time and uh, we are very honored to have all of you uh, describe us how you run your labs, uh, conduct your research and thrive. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, it was really for me uh, eye opening and wonderful. And um, I hope that uh, you continue with us for the next uh, day or so, today and tomorrow. And our next session is Neuromatch with Kids. So uh, I would highly encourage everyone to, to join that as well. So thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.